Hey, Michael the Web Guy here. If you enjoy listening to KPFA online, why not visit kpfa.org and join the KPFA family? It's just $25 a year. Your membership will help KPFA continue to provide important on-air and online content that is unique and informative. Visit kpfa.org for more information. Thank you in advance for your support. All right, good health, and welcome to today's edition of About Health. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Lenore. Let me change microphones. I think I'm... Oh, I guess uh, now I'm on the right microphone. Uh, good health and welcome to today's edition of About Health. I'm Dr. Mike Lenorm. Welcome to our program. Today, a special Father's Day edition of About Health. We have with, uh, as our guest, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Courtney. Dr. Courtney is a nationally, internationally recognized um, psychologist whose uh, expertise is in the area of men's health. Uh, he is uh, based uh, had been based in Berkeley, probably still is. If they're, they're still allowing you over there, <laughs> they are still based in Berkeley, <laughs> and actually has a broad experience in um, dealing with the health of, of men. Uh, has developed a particular interest, and we'll find out why in the whole area of, um, of men's postpartum depression. He's going to be here with us for the Father's Day hour. You know, we don't give fathers much time on about health, and I think that uh, each of us has an individual relationship with our children as fathers and with our fa- with our fathers as fathers. And so, consequently, this is a good opportunity for us to. Uh, share some of your experiences, maybe even uh, talk a bit about your own uh, experience as a father or being parented. Uh, but it's our Father's Day edition of About Health. I bet, Mickey, there's nobody else on KPFA who's paying attention to fathers on Father's Day like this. So so we want to um, take some credit for that. So welcome to our program, Dr. Will Courtney. Well, thanks. It's great to be back. All right, tell us a little bit about um, uh, your area of expertise in, in men's health. What does that mean? Well, uh, I, I came here today really to talk about men's postpartum depression, right. but um, I've been studying men's health, um, what, for 15 years now. It was long before it was a popular topic. Um, and so I've been researching it and writing about it and um, talking with folks about it and also training health professionals about how to work with men and sort of the best ways to, to work with men to best help them. In a very generic way, how, how are men's attitudes toward health different from women's? Well, they can, they can vary quite a bit. They have very different perceptions about their health. For example, they are much less likely to perceive themselves to be a risk for, even for health problems that they're at greater risk for than women. Um, and, of course, um, when it comes to depression, um, men are more likely than women to try to hide depression um, from others. And, of course, that only worsens it. Do you think as men approach health, both, psych- both physical and mental health, that they are, um, you know, I think men are more fearful than women about getting bad news about health. And that kind of conditions when they go for screening, when they go for well visits. I think women are far more uh, courageous in that area. I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating because we don't really know why that is. We do know that men oftentimes stay away from doctors because they're afraid of that bad news that you were talking about. But um, we don't really know why that is other than um, I think there is a real threat um, to their masculinity, to their ability to function in their role as men, as fathers, as workers, um, and they don't want that undermined. Yeah, I think my wife, which, my wife goes every day, every the minute her test is due, she's right at the doctor. You know, I have to get to the NBA playoffs now to, before I get my physical this year. It's only a couple months overdue. <laughs> How'd you get in the area of postpartum depression? When you think about postpartum depression, you, nowadays you're thinking about people coming back from Iraq or people who go through major traumas. What got you interested in it uh, just through your experience? Well, I'm, I'm a psychotherapist here in Berkeley. So it was really through my work um, as a psychotherapist and also becoming a, a father. Um, after having become a father, I became more interested in the experiences that uh, new dads had. But I started to see in my practice um, more and more new dads uh, who were experiencing depression. And I got very curious about it because no one I knew was talking about it. And 
lo and behold, there's actually a lot of research, a lot of good data about men out there who experience a postpartum depression, and that's pretty striking. You know, we've there in the United States alone, a thousand new dads each day become depressed, and according to some studies, that number is as high as three thousand. That's as many as one in four new dads who have postpartum depression. So it's not a it's an insignificant problem. The intuitive position would be that they become depressed because. Of, all of a sudden, they got this, this competition within the household, but I'm sure it goes much deeper than that. Well, we're unfortunately only starting to really discover what some of the, the causes are. Certainly, um, being kind of left on the sidelines after a child is born certainly can contribute or um, kind of help lead to a, a depression. But there are a number of causes, I, the potential causes. Sleep deprivation, probably we're going to find out is going to be one of the major ones. I mean, we do know that um, when normal, healthy adults uh, go without good sleep for just a month, they begin to show all of the signs of sleep, uh, of all the signs of uh, clinical depression. So it's likely that sleep deprivations plays a role. Hormones are also probably playing a role. You know, we think of hormonal changes when we think of childbirth. We think of pregnant women and nursing mothers. But men go through hormonal changes too, both during pregnancy and also postpartum. And it's a double whammy. Not only do our testosterone levels go down, but our estrogen levels go up. Um, so we've got more female hormones coursing through our bodies and less male hormones. And that can really wreak havoc on a, on a man's life. And this is because, why does that happen? We don't know what it's, we just know that it happens. It we happens don't know. When, 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 when somebody else gives birth, it happens to men. That's right. When their partner, partner is giving birth. birth, it happens to men. <laughs> Could it be uh, the lack of sexual opportunities? Could it, is it, is it having to do with that or? Just don't know. It's a great question, and I think one we'll be be looking at in the in the years to come. Well, you know, one other um, potential. There are a few other potential causes. Um, one of the best thing that predicts um, a man having postpartum depression is if his partner has postpartum depression. So half of all men whose partners have postpartum depre- depression are depressed themselves. Um, also, a rocky relationship with their partner, a history of depression, having a sicker, colicky baby, um, having a lack of social support, and also economic stress. You know, here in the Bay Area, it takes two working uh, parents usually to maintain a household, and when one of them goes off on maternity, maternity leave, then all of that responsibility, all that economic pressure and responsibility usually falls on the shoulders of dad. Do you think a lot of it has to, there must be some, um, I was reading an article, in, I guess it was Science or Discover magazine that talked about the importance of, you know, of positioning and culture. That means they're talking about siblings, but they were also talking about uh, in the research that was done in Europe that um, that the only two people responsible for the preservation of culture were mothers and grandmothers, and that fathers had, uh, you know, no role in that whole process other than a biologic one. And there really isn't much in many in many the the ones that I've seen where the depression is greatest are the ones who don't don't get don't feel that they have a role in the process. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that involvement may uh, may be a um, a, um, a, ba- a not a barrier but may reduce the likelihood of postpartum uh, postpartum depression in in men? Well, you know, I it's a it's an interesting point because um, you know I think there is a, a very powerful sense of loss that men experience and and don't anticipate because no one talks about this or very few people talk about it after their child is born and their partner um, has now got a 24-7 job taking care of a baby and she's she's gone and again he's sort of just on the sidelines and uh, he has lost this main source of support you know we do know that men have much smaller social networks than women do and they have fewer friendships than women do and they rely primarily oftentimes on their partner or spouse for so sources of emotional support so when that support is taken away um, that's a powerful loss uh, for men 
We're talking Dr. Will Courtney. He is a Ph.D. and uh, uh, with a tremendous interest in um, in the health of men. We're talking about postpartum depression. If you want to join us, sharing your experiences or uh, contributing to the uh, conversation philosophically, however you want to do this, our number in the 510 area code is 8484425, 8484425, and our 1-800 number is 9589008. Uh, now tell us, what uh, what are the other mental health problems? problems that uh, men experience after the birth of children? Well, <clears throat> most typically, um, anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder are the two most common mental conditions. Um, and we know that when someone has ex- anxiety uh, postpartum, that that oftentimes leads to depression. So it's important that that get treated early. Um, but, you know, uh, those are kind of clinical conditions, but we also just see some, a lot of new dads just not being very happy or being kind of miserable and not expecting that. You know, they expected, you know, this kind of blissful, baby blissful experience, um, you know, with their new child. <laughs> and when they don't have that uh, experience, um, it's confusing. And so a lot of, a lot of, I hear from dads who, can feel like they they just don't have any connection mm. with the baby or they can't stand the smell uh, of their baby or their baby crying just drives them crazy they can't stand to be around a baby who's crying and they feel you know a lot of um, guilt oftentimes about having these feelings and also feel completely alone because they don't know that anybody else is experiencing this now let me one other question I have do you think that um the, if the mother doesn't well let's say if the mother mothers quite naturally get absorbed in the care primary care babies do you think many mothers recognize that that postpartum depression may be a phenomenon and their partner uh, you know I doubt it, but most people don't. Uh, even mental health professionals uh, don't often realize this. And actually, this is why it's important to see a mental health professional who specializes in, in working with men, who recognizes these kinds of things. Mm. Um, depression oftentimes looks different in men. You know, when we think of a, t- a depressed person, we usually think of somebody who's sad and crying. But, you know, picture instead a guy who's working 60 hours a week, who's um, being kind of short-tempered, drinking a couple of martinis at lunchtime, slipping out of the office to have an affair, and then speeding home to his wife in the evening. Now, we don't think of that as depression, no, but I, those are I, some I, of the signs of depression I, I, in men. I don't really think of that as depression, but you're right. Mm-hmm. But, anger, yeah. anger, irritability, mm-hmm. um, also with withdrawing from others, mm-hmm. um, increased drug or alcohol use, impulsiveness. Mm-hmm. Those are all things mm-hmm. that are... Um, characteristic of men's depression or signs of an underlying depression in men. So it isn't, uh, you know, I, I think oftentimes women are the first to spot that something is kind of wrong. Um, and, you know, I'll hear often from a man, you know, he'll say, you know, my wife said I just haven't been myself lately. And, you know, I think she's right. And just that kind of sense of something being a little off um, is oftentimes spotted first by uh, um, a woman, uh, the spouse or partner. Uh, is is the incidence of postpartum depression in men different in different cultures or different ethnic groups and certainly depend upon the roles that they play in that period? Hmm. Well, uh, it's a great question, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of information on, on that, so we don't know, but we do know um, about men's depression in general. We know that, for example, that men of color are much less likely to get mental health treatment for depression. And if they do get treatment, it's of a much poorer quality than the care that white men get. So there's that difference. Um, so, and there's also differences in their attitudes um, among men and men who have more traditional attitudes and african-american men for example have more traditional attitudes about what it means to be a man and those men are also less likely to seek help or health care now why do you think they get a different level of care i mean is it just is not available or is it a disparity is it different difficult to do there's just not enough well uh, it's, they're not going it, for it, it's or? certainly a dis- it's certainly a disparity they are not going for it on the one hand but when they do they're not getting the good quality treatment that other men are getting. So uh, it's a disparity in our healthcare system. And, you know, fortunately, there are, there are folks out there who are 
working to fix that disparity, but um, it still exists today. Dr. Will Courtney is our guest. He is a uh, has a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He's a licensed clinical social worker, member of the clinical faculty, Department of Psychiatry at Harvard University Medical School, and previously served in the clinical, clinical faculty, University of California San Francisco Medical School. We're talking about postpartum depression. We want you to join us. Let's go first to Eric in Oakland. You're on about health. Hi. How you doing today? How you doing, Eric? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Um, I've got a the question that might have actually already been answered. Um, I've got four children, and um, my wife tells me, like the doctor just said, uh, she thinks that I've changed. I'm not the fun guy I used to be. Um, I don't feel any different than I've always felt, but how would I know? Mm. Well, thanks, Eric, for calling. It's really great to hear from from you. Um, you know, what I, I would suggest, you know, I, I set up a website for men with postpartum depression. It's at saddaddy.com, saddaddy.com. And if you go there, there is an assessment that you can complete there that will help you determine whether you might have depression. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, how would you know? Again, I think, you know, even mental health clinicians don't often kind of recognize men's depression. In fact, we know that trained mental health professionals are less likely to correctly diagnose depression in men than in women. So the fact that you don't recognize depression in yourself um, is is no surprise. But I think if your wife is telling you that um, she thinks you've changed, it's probably worth taking that seriously and and thinking more about it. And I would I'd suggest going to saddaddy.com and, and and filling out that assessment and seeing what you find out. I'm sorry, did you say sad daddy? That's correct. S a d d a d y. That's correct. Okay. God, can I uh, expound on that a little bit? Please go ahead. Uh, well, one of the things she's noticed is that um, I'm I'm usually a very very calm person. Things that you know. She's excitable. Um, I usually just, you know, I'm able to let roll off my shoulders, but she's noticed that I'm a little, you know, quicker to the temper with the kids, not meaning that I, you know, I beat them or anything like that, but um, smaller things tend to just irritate me. And I, I, I'm, I'm always sleepy. I always, uh, you know, if I sit for more than 10 minutes at a time, I'm falling asleep. And, I mean, that might have to do with my work schedule and the job that I do, but I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, both of the both of the things that you uh, mentioned, to Eric, um, can be signs. I mean, symptoms of depression. That doesn't necessarily mean you are depressed, but um, irritability is one of the things that we do see in men um, with an underlying depression. Um, this the sleepiness is something that's more of a kind of a classic kind of symptom of depression, either sleeping a lot or sleeping less. So, um, uh, again, it's probably worth um, um, thinking about this more and perhaps talking to uh, a, a mental health provider about it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. You, you haven't, maybe you haven't teased this out of your data yet, but uh, the more children you have, uh, how does that impact uh, postpartum depression with each new sibling that's our baby that's born into a family is it more or less likely yeah that that is something we don't actually know the answer to but i think now that you're bringing up kids i think it is is a good time to to mention that um postpartum depression in men has a negative impact on their kids and that negative impact is three to five years later we see emotional and behavioral problems in those kids of um men who had postpartum depression when those kids were born or in the first year. Um, so, and I certainly encourage men, if you can't manage to get help for yourself, certainly do it for your kids because we know it has a has a tremendous impact on them. All right, let's go to Johanna and Clovis. You're on about health. Hi, thank you. It's actually my first time on the air, so thank you very much for taking my call. Um, I was listening in, and I just wanted to make the point of hearing about hormone levels. It seems um, kind of obvious to me in raising boys that you go through puberty and your hormones level changes and you work with that. And then when you become an adult, if, if you change, you become somewhat more maternal, let's say, that of course there would be changes. And both in men and women, if you pay attention to the changes, then you can control depression. And so I just thought that was a very interesting point, and I think there are some answers in that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a... Um, <clears throat> 
A colleague of mine told me a story um, just a couple of weeks ago that was really fascinating. She, I had told her about these hormonal changes, and she was talking uh, with, a, uh, with a man um, who was talking with her about sleep. And she explained this to him, and he started getting tearful. And he said, you know, uh, last week I was driving, and I saw a squirrel get hit by a car, and I burst into tears. And, you know, he had no way of understanding that or explaining that to himself. Um, but hearing that information really suddenly made sense to him. And I think the, the, the tears he felt probably were tears of relief, just knowing that there was something kind of chemical going on in his body. All right. Uh, let's go to Craig and Napa, I believe it is. Oh, uh, actually, it's Mid Pines. Mid Pines. Oh, Hi. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but it seems to be um, childbirth afternoon on KPFA. Uh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> did you hear the previous uh, uh, hour? I did not. I caught a little bit of it. Yeah, uh, they were playing mm-hmm. uh, about 35 minutes of the audio from a, a, the new film by uh, uh, from Ricky Lake. It's called The Business of Being Born, comparing uh, birthing practices in hospitals versus home births and midwives uh, and things like that. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, that's certainly close to my heart. I, um, my wife and I have, uh, well, two grown children now, but uh, they were both bo- born at home with midwives. And actually, uh, we were involved for uh, uh, many years ago in uh, childbirth education. My wife currently teaches human development, and this is the first time I've ever heard anybody actually say that there is such a thing as paternal uh, postpartum depression. I'm going to uh, make sure that she listens to the program. Um, and I jotted down a bunch of notes of, of possible things that would influence uh, whether some, uh, a father ends up developing uh, postpartum depression. Um, and I'll just kind of run through them, you know, and you can comment as you see fit after I, after I get done, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, one would be whether the uh, the father took childbirth classes before the birth and was therefore prepared, more prepared for what was to come. Another one would be, when re- related to that, I guess, would be what role the father played during the birth, if any. Um, I think that's probably very important. Uh, another one, which I kind of touched on here, was would be whether the birth was... Uh, a medicalized hospital birth, and we have you know such a huge cesarean rate now, um, or or versus uh, say a home birth or a less medicalized birth with a midwife, and um, then finally, um, I'm wondering if 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 people have looked at the differences between countries that have good family leave policies versus the United States, which is atrocious. All good, all good questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are g- great questions, Craig. And, you know, unfortunately, this um, this research is at such a kind of young state that we right. Re- right. really have great answers to this. I mean, part of what I think you are getting at, though, are um, the changing roles of men in, and fathers mm-hmm. um, in, as parents. And so when you talk about the, the role that fathers play in childbirth or being present at the childbirth, I mean, it wasn't so long ago when fathers weren't even allowed in the, in the room where babies yeah. were born. So um, but things are changing. And, you know, what I think a, a lot of men are really confused about these changing roles. I think, you know, one of the biggest ones is that they are going to be, they are expected to be more involved as parents. And yet, for most of these guys, they had dads that had a completely hands-off approach to parenting. And so they didn't learn any parenting skills from their dads. And that leaves them really uncertain about what to do. And, you know, that uncertainty can very quickly lead to anxiety and again anxiety postpartum can very quickly lead to depression um so i, I think that's part of what i think about when i hear those um questions is about the, the changing roles of of fathers i mean fathers certainly have been sidelined and i think they're being more involved now and that's a great thing but again i think fathers from the father's perspective um being involved is not always such a good thing because they're so they feel so unprepared so often. I think getting involved in parenting classes, and we're fortunate here in the Bay Area that um, uh, there are parenting classes available with dads involved. I go to a class at Alta Bates here in Berkeley um, where we actually talk about the experience of both 
men and women postpartum and talk about postpartum depression. Um, so those kinds of classes are happening, and, and I think that's, uh, that's certainly going to help men to be prepared. All right, thank you very much for that contribution, uh, Casey. 848, Craig, I'm sorry, 848-4425 is our number. The 51 area code, 1-800-958-9008 is our 800 number. We're here, here with Dr. Will Courtney, who's an expert in men's health, currently interested uh, um, for the purposes of our conversation in postpartum depression in men. You know, we were talking just before I, we came on the air about the role that fathers did play. You know, when I was growing up, my, you know, my father was obviously a, not obviously, but my father was so untypical of the father that you see on TV, uh, as models of how you're supposed to be. I mean, he, he was, uh, going to work, he spoke to us, you know, on occasions, there were not, there weren't, there wasn't a lot of, you know, didactic, uh, interactive conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he wasn't, didn't avoid us by any stretch of the imagination. And we had picnics and birthday parties and the whole deal. But I don't require, I don't ever recall discussing much with him in terms of the, uh, the limits. You know, like we sit down, well, let's negotiate some limits. Uh, I mean, the limits were as the limits were. And I'm sure that he felt that once a baby was born and his job was to support that infant and that support was more, much more structural than it was emotional. Uh, and I think that fathers of the day, as I talk to colleagues of my era, were like that. Um, uh, and I wonder if, um, as you say, now these roles have expanded, at least the expectations of everybody else. Uh, so let's say uh, if, if women are co- – and the other thing is if women come up in a household where the father took a different role, how does that play in the role that the father expects to play after the delivery? I mean, that would be a bit confusing, and it's like, it's almost like, as again, the soliloquy here, it's almost like uh, my wife who expects me to fix furniture, which I'm not going to do. I never learned how to do it. My dad didn't do it. Her father did. You know, I like it's like uh, say the same thing that happened. Her uh, some fathers, uh, some women are raised in families where the father's just engaged in everything. Everybody sits down to dinner, and and then you come along with a whole different philosophy. I uh, baby's born, and you got to feel out of the mix. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I I think you're I think you're right, and especially now, again, as these roles are changing for men. Um, it really does leave them confused about what they're supposed to do. Um, they had a father, sounds like you had a kind of strong, silent type of father, uh, and that's what they, they learned. And unfortunately, that is what a lot of uh, men learn, and that's how they're supposed to be as fathers. So fathers is what they think they're supposed to be. And so it is very confusing when suddenly people are talking about them being actually involved in, in parenting their kids. Well, why, why, why are women so much better prepared in m- most instances? I mean, of course, there's a lot of postpartum depression in women. And how is that postpartum depression, well, in terms of dynamics, how is postpartum depression in women different from postpartum depression in men? Well, um, uh, probably the, 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 the most, the clearest way is that for men, uh, postpartum depression can show up a little later. Um, not always, but sometimes it can show up later in the first year, um, whereas for women it shows up earlier. Um, but we have, to, we have to think about the differences in depression in general, um, which also f- figure in here. Women who are depressed look much more like sort of what we picture as somebody who is depressed, somebody sad and crying oftentimes. Um, and men, again, can look more like... Um, you know, our first caller, Eric, who was, um, you know, who's more irritable. And that's much more common in men. We also um, see much more, uh, uh, many more complaints of physical problems in men. So headaches and stomach aches or ongoing kind of physical problems mm. uh, reported by men who have an underlying depression. That's more common in, in men than women. And I think it's easier for some men to talk about a physical problem than it is uh, a mental health problem. All right, let's go to Sean and Concord. You're on about health. Hi, doctor and doctor. Uh, my question is, does this, I was wondering if there's any uh, more to it than just the postpartum. It, could men experience some of the same things that women experience through the birthing or through the pregnancy process, some of the weird, quirky things, um, n- nausea, uh, headaches, 
uh, when I, I have four kids, and every time my wife was pregnant, we would both go through the same sort of uh, things during the pregnancy that, like, I would go through the same stuff she'd go through. Yes. Uh, I, I, it was just really strange. We thought it was weird. We didn't really talk about it much. Um, and I just, I'm listening to this right now, and I was wondering, is there any studies about that? Does that happen too? Yes, it does, Sean, and you're not alone. That That is something that happens. Uh, um, sometimes in men, and those are called sympathetic symptoms. And um, so you um, uh, would be a sympathetic guy um, for having experienced those with her. So, yes, it does happen uh, for men. W- what about your experience after the, your kids were born? Now, Sean, are you on a speakerphone? Yes, I am. Could you pick the phone up because we're getting a little... Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm going uh, uh, to speak. I drive a truck, so... Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll don't to... stop. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, we can hear you much better. Okay. Um, um, well, I, I get the, the part about being tired. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really tired I, I, all the time. I'm, I, and the man said earlier about sitting down for 10 minutes. If I am not focused on something, I just want to go to sleep. And, and we're beyond losing sleep with our children, though. They are all still pretty young. My youngest is uh, almost two. Uh, they all sleep through the night. They don't really bother us at nighttime anymore. But I've never been able to catch up on the sleep we lost uh, during during the time when they were waking up for uh, bottle feedings and breast feedings and and other things that kids wake up for in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, that's I, I don't think uh, I've been depressed, just tired. <laughs> and Dr. Lenore is here laughing. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I know that I'm laughing with you. Not mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I remember it's, those days. It's, now, it's, my my wife got really bad postpartum syndrome. In fact, she had to get on medication before the baby was born because it would get so bad afterwards that she'd have to go to the hospital. She was having trouble breathing. She was scared mm-hmm. that she was going to die or something. She'd mm-hmm. have these uncontrollable feelings and. And and they would you know by the fourth child the doctors um, had a solution for it through some medication mm. by the fourth uh, child yeah that's that's unfortunate and, and um, you know it, it just points out too that you know there's still a lot of um, kind of lack of awareness about women's postpartum still um, to this day and um, I'm sorry that she had to go through three childbirths before discovering that. Yeah. Okay, but Sean, Sean brings up some good points, Doctor. Uh, what about the attitude of the father toward the pregnancy in the first place? I mean, how much does that play into um, various types of responses after birth? I mean, uh, say you got somebody with three children. I happen to have four, and, and uh, we, we kind of wanted four. Um, I guess we had three girls we wanted, and we got four girls. But uh, And we're happy about that. But but I, what about the attitude? What are, what are the signs that before the pregnancy, the father's attitude toward the pregnancy might ultimately predict a postpartum depression? Well, uh, one of them is anxiety about becoming a father. Um, so men who are anxious about kind of what their role is going to be, what it's going to be like, what it's going to be like economically, um, men who are anxious before their child are, bo- are born are probably at a greater risk of postpartum depression. So those, um, you know, those those are men who would be um, well advised to get involved in a, a, a parenting class if they haven't already done that with their partner. Um, they can get into a expectant fathers class. Uh, or join a men's group. Um, so increasing sources of support um, around you would be important to do for those men and, and, and for any men who may have any of the kind of the risk factors for having postpartum depression. Again, if they have a history of depression, if they have a troubled relationship with their partner, it's better to get couples kind of get counseling as a couple uh, before their child is born rather than waiting until after. Dr. Will Courtney is our guest. He's a Ph.D. Uh, practicing cl- clinical psychologist on faculty at Harvard University, Harvard University and, uh, and for many years on the clinical faculty at the University of California, San Francisco. He's done a lot of research in the area of men's ha- uh, health, uh, developed a 
research-based six-point plan for doctors and other clinicians to work more effectively with men uh, uh, probably should be more widely distributed. I don't think we've got that down just yet. If you want to join and talk to us about postpartum depression, your attitudes, attitudes that uh, you think um, you uh, can share with us, ideas that you have about what we've talked about, 510-848-4425, In addition, we're not going to get far away from postpartum depression, but in addition to postpartum depression, are there other predictable, or at least by predictable, I mean uh, in sufficient num- groups, uh, numbers of men to be cons- concerning, other types of um, uh, definable mental problems that men have around pregnancies? Well, uh, again, the most common it would be anxiety and obsessive compulsive uh, disorders. Now, now, when you say obsessive compulsive disorders, I think that doesn't mean a lot to our audience. What mm-hmm. exactly is the manifestation of that? Well, this would be the guy who, you know, has to check the door, um, you know, many times before he leaves the house. Um, well, he's got to make sure that um, the, the oven has not been left on, um, has to wash his hands several times a day. Those are those are some of the signs of, of obsessive compulsive disorder. And again, those are more common um, uh, postpartum um, than other you know, mental health disorders. But again, I think it's also important to point out just this kind of, even if it isn't depression, this kind of miserable feeling that a lot of men can feel um, about not connecting with their, their the child or feeling a real sense of loss of their partner. Um, I see a lot of them. We do see a lot of that. I mean, uh, and that, you know, the, the, the folk, especially in first pregnancies where the focal point is the baby and then the father's kind of off in the corner. And actually the bond is between the mother and the baby with not an invitation for the father to be more inclusive, although I think we're, that's changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we see a lot of that. What, in a perfect world, in terms of prenatal education, what would you build into it such that men would recognize or fathers would recognize that this is a potential problem? Well, I think uh, parenting classes, for example, like the ones that I um, attend at, at Al Debates. But how would you incorporate in that kind of curriculum uh, information that would strike the fathers that this is a potential difficulty? Well, we let them know about it. That's one of the first things we do. We let them know that it exists so that they can go in um, prepared for it. Um, we also talk, have couples talk about their fears. Um, one of the things we're doing now at Alta Bates is separating out the men and the women and, and asking them when they're alone to write down uh, anonymously on a piece of paper what their greatest fears are because, you know, people go in um, to this experience uh, expecting that it is going to be this baby blissful experience that's going to look like a Hallmark card. And when it doesn't, um, people can be really devastated by the effects of depression and, and, and the effects it has on their whole experience of uh, starting a family. So we help, we help parents to see that, in fact, um, there are, are a lot of fears that people have going into it and that sometimes those fears are realized. Um, and it's not always um, what it's cracked up to be. Eight four eight four four two five is in our five one zero area code one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. Our guest, Doctor Will Courtney, the, uh, his interest is in postpartum depression in men and a very distinguished career in the health of men. If you want to join us, we have a couple of open lines. It's close to Father's Day, and if you know if you if you're out there and you just had a new baby, it's a good time to ask a couple of questions, especially if you're starting to feel some of the things that we've talked about. What, what, when you talk about the differences, when you talk about I mean, I've always believed, obviously, there's differences in men's health and women's health, and we do such a poor job of encouraging men to pick up the gauntlet of preventive health. What are the differences when, and how do you approach men differently from um, from uh, women? And is it important that if you recognize this as a parent, male parent, that you seek out someone with experiences working with men? Well, well, definitely. And um, as I mentioned earlier, especially for mental health problems, and I'm a psychotherapist, um, trained mental health clinicians are not as good at identifying depression in men as they are identifying depression in women. Um, You know, and the fact is we're human and we grew up um, with the same stereotypes that everybody else grew up with. And so we're oftentimes blind uh, to men's pain. We just don't see it. And especially the way 
men's depression gets uh, the way it manifests and the way it looks, which is oftentimes different uh, in men than in women. Um, so it is important to see a mental health uh, clinician who really does have experience in working with men and understands men. You know, oftentimes as a you know, therapist, um, and I, I know a lot of therapists out there have had this experience where a woman, a woman comes in and sits down in the office and she sits down and she starts talking and she starts talking and talking and will tell you about her concerns and her fears and her problems. And a guy comes in and he sits down and he says, okay, I'm here. What should I do? Right. Kind of like the soprano model. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, for, for a mental health provider who is not trained in working with men, that can just spell the beginning of the end of that um, helping that man. Now, you, you have, you recently had, you know, not recently, but your children are relatively young. Were you surprised by any of your attitudes uh, about being a father and how that all played into, you know, your own psyche? I, I was surprised at how difficult it is being a parent. I, I wasn't prepared for I mean, I, I was very much looking forward to becoming a parent. And I, in fact, I was a part-time and am a part-time stay-at-home dad. Um, mm-hmm. So, and I, I love that and mm-hmm. um, had really looked forward to doing that. Um, but I, I had no idea how difficult it was. I, I thought I was going to be that perfect dad um, who did all the right things mm-hmm. and took them all the right places and said all the right things. Mm-hmm. And it is a it is a very difficult and very demanding and very challenging and when they say uh, it's the hardest job you you will ever do being a parent I, it's it, that is so true yeah i wonder you know i guess and then this is off the subject but i i am like i shared a, a different story i had became a single father quite suddenly of four children and um and uh, through that experience learned how to parent and you know just you know, kind of winging it for quite a while mm. Uh, I think that my experience, I, I don't know my girls would say, but it was certainly much more valuable for me than it was for, th- for them because otherwise, you know, I would have been the kind of fairly traditional father. You know, my model was my dad's model. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. out of that became a a, a great experience uh, that I had, that, you know, and, and looking back. But I wonder why is it so much easier, and this is off, way off the subject, why is it so much easier to be a grandfather than it is to be a father? I mean, it's so much easier to be a grandfather. I mean, I know all the traditional response. Oh, you're not responsible. But you feel, I think this is some whole, some whole different bond that develops there. I can tell you it's much easier. Well, we may go back to talking about hormones again, right. which are um, oh, they're you know, going, they're de- going. De- <laughs> decreasing every <laughs> year on us. Right. And, um, right. you know, that makes us much more, um, you know, much more kind of, empathic um, yes. people who are, and I think probably more involved um, caring uh, grandfathers mm-hmm. although I, I can't talk to that <laughs> point <Quite> yet. yet. <laughs> Alright let's go to San Francisco talk to John you're in about health. Oh, hi Dr. Lenore. Hi John. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, is slightly off point but kind of similar like uh, in my situation if you had just loved, uh, lost a job that you really loved and you had been involved with it for many years it seems to me some of the things and uh, the feelings I have seem to be very similar to what are being discussed for a father going through postpartum depression even down to you know keeping paperwork and things which I really don't need anymore but not being able to let go and move on does that kind of uh, post working um, uh, situation sounds similar to you as far as like a postpartum type of thing, uh, especially when you were involved with a job that you loved and that you cared about very much and uh, it meant a lot to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think it certainly, it certainly can. And you're talking about um, a loss, and as we said um, uh, earlier, that uh, one of the things that may kind of trigger postpartum depression in men is really the loss of um, their partner and their old way of life with their their partner. Um, so I think there is a lot of loss that is involved. But, um, you know, for men in particular, you know, our, our work, now this is changing. I mean, certainly um, many more women um, are identifying as 
as workers and career minded people but you know as 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 mothers they identify strongly oftentimes with that role as a mother but for men um, oftentimes it's our work that really kind of defines us and makes us who we are and um, and that's the way men think about their work and the loss of a job can it can be a, have a powerful impact on a man um, it is basically like losing part of your identity um, and with that loss comes a great deal of emotional pain um, in my case it was something that I had a great passion for and mm. so it wasn't just a uh, a way of um, uh, I've worked at very low-paying jobs. This was a professional job, but it also gave me great satisfaction. And it was and a of, sense of self-worth, I would as, imagine. Oh, absolute self-worth mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and something that I never took for granted. It was something that I, I even pinched myself to think, my God, mm-hmm. I'm actually gaining a wage to do something, or to, in my case, being a teacher. Uh, and But it, it uh, boy, the world of politics and everything else, it or job quality just doesn't measure into it. It's just, it can be very cutthroat. And uh, mm-hmm. so you're kind of like left hanging. It's almost like, like having a phantom limb or something. It's just, yeah. it keeps on firing. Um, I think that's a, a great way of putting it, John, the, the phantom limb. Um, what were some of the, the symptoms that you n- recognized in yourself when you were hearing the... Well, as I was going through it and what I still have now, and, I, and as I was talking to a, a, a friend earlier, I still have copies of work-related articles and things that are just, now that I ha- don't have an office or a, a t- place to have kept them, they're all in my room uh, cluttering up things. That, and uh, the clutter is actually preventing me from putting new things in to go out on and venture out to do something on my own and not be anybody's... Um, you know, under anybody else's thumb, I have the chance to do something else, but I have all this clutter and I have this incredible feeling like if I throw it out, I'm going to need it later. Mm, you're not ready to let go of that. And, mm-hmm. yeah, and I really, uh, you know, it's about time I, sh- I should, but there's just this gut feeling that I'll need it down the line, that somewhere I'll start teaching again, and all this incredible work that I put into creating this stuff is um, going to be gone. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, it's holding John, me back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I could hear how it would be holding you back. Now, if you thought about talking to a mental health provider? Uh, it, well, I did, and, and, and the, basically they said that, that obsessive compulsiveness is not something to be, you know, ashamed of, that it, it's, it, it, what it really is is clinging on to something, and, and, uh, and it's not easy. You know, mm-hmm. it's something, you know, definitely, you're not atypical. Um, uh, it's part of losing... Um, like it is, it's part of, like losing a partner, something mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. a person you had a, a great deep passion for, and uh, even getting a master's degree was part of being able to have that job that you lost. So it's it's been you know it's been agonizing actually mm-hmm. um, at times. So, sounds like it. Uh, you know, I don't mean to be spilling my own thing on air or anything like that, but I I thought that geez, what you're talking about postpartum so similarly described what I was doing and some of the things that I was doing. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, think, I think you're right about that, and I think that there are some real similarities, I think. Uh, but I think that uh, cause staying with that mental health professional is very important through this period, and I think eventually, like all of us, uh, you know, you'll start, I think, to break through this. But uh, thank you for sharing that story with us. Yeah, and, thank you, John, uh, and I and, uh, wish you well with that. And certainly, I mean, we are talking about men's depression, so I'm, yeah, I'm glad we, you called. One of the uh, hundred, well, I guess it's the 800-pound gorilla in the room we haven't talked about, is uh, what role does the difference uh, uh, in, in the sexual relationships between the partner play into this postpartum depression thing? I mean, obviously... What, what sexual relationship? Well, let me just say this to you. So in many instances, when babies are born, uh, either the woman or the man takes a different attitude towards sex. I mean, certainly in the first few months, you've got to deal with the baby. And there's a certain time frame, and uh, some men want to push that time frame up or push it back. There's no clear time frame ever mm-hmm. really given. Mm-hmm. And so consequently, it has to kind of come and evolve mm-hmm. as a partnership. But it certainly can change things. I mean, there are some <laughs> some situations that, as a pediatrician, I've seen, is because it does come up in some of the discussions, that uh, as long as there's somebody in the neighborhood, now that the baby's there, then one of the partners doesn't feel comfortable. So uh, obviously that does change at some point. 
point, you know, when baby's crying all night and you're tired and they're tired, does that contribute much to postpartum mm-hmm. depression in men? Yeah, and actually, I was I was making light when I when I said what <laughs> oh, what sexual relationship to, because oftentimes I, I, you're the therapist. I thought I'd defend that. I said, well, maybe I'm wrong about that. <laughs> there, oftentimes, mm-hmm. uh, there really there isn't a sexual relationship, and and that's not something that men. Uh, kind of bargain for going into this they didn't and people don't talk about it. as you say mm-hmm. it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room and no one's talking about it um and and yes they these these men i mean this is one of the ways that they uh, presumably connected with their their partner and um again it is yet another loss that these men have to experience they not only don't have that shoulder to lean on uh, the only shoulder that they ever really lean on um and they don't have their sexual partner um and that's pretty typical and i think i think those losses are are really tremendous for men and and uh, what i'm also seeing in my practice is that um they kind of call up and remind men of other losses in their lives, and I think that contributes to depression. Um, you know, I've seen some some men who had mothers who were clinically depressed um, or alcoholics um, when they were babies, and uh, they didn't really have a mother there. And when they lose that partner that they've had there, and she's gone, uh, there's kind of a mother in the room, but she's really not there for him um it's it's a powerful it's a powerful experience of loss i think and it probably is a uh, a trigger for postpartum depression dr will courtney is our guest and he is the uh, one of the founders of the international uh, journal of men's health i got interested in the whole issue of postpartum depression in men as a result of his own parenting experience and his uh as as a lifelong experience as a psychologist we're talking about postpartum depression plenty of time for you to share your story or ask a question uh, get engaged in our conversation 8484425 in the 510 area code 1-800-958-9008 let's go to kim you're on about in berkeley you're on about health Hi, uh, yeah, I was just curious, how do moms support husbands through that process, especially if some of the moms are dealing with postpartum depression themselves? I mean, we're about to have our second child, and I've already called a counselor just because I can already feel mm. anxiety around it, but without stepping on my husband's toes, I don't want to say, well, you know, maybe you should call somebody too. So how do, how do you provide that in a supportive way where you don't feel like you're emasculating your husband? Well, oh, Kim, you bring us so many important points. Um, you know, uh, one thing to be very... Me, Kim, do you have your radio on? No. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I had on speaker. I got you off now. All right. Good. Uh, yeah, there's so, so much that you brought up, uh, Kim. Um, you know, in terms of the emasculating uh, part, you know, I, we need to be very clear that depression is a clinical problem. And... Uh, not only people like yourself or men um, in general tend to think about it as being sort of a weakness of character, a flaw, um, a chink in their armor, you know, if they have depression. And it's not. It's a clinical disorder, and it's very treatable, and uh, it's actually a good time to just make that point now. Um, postpartum depression and anxiety are both very treatable, but they, a, a man needs to get help in order to do that. Um, some of what you can do, um, you know, men are oftentimes more comfortable with the notion of, um, you know, getting getting some kind of consultation or, you know, coaching is another way to talk about it. Um, those are things that are much more um, uh, sort of easy for men to... Um, kind of grapple with the notion of doing that rather than going into therapy. Um, so talking about it, that might be might be helpful. As you said, I mean, it sounds like you've... Have you had postpartum depression before, Kim? No, I had a very easy and wonderful first pregnancy, but I can feel the anxiety already, and I'm two months away from labor. Mm-hmm. And it's so great that you're getting help because that anxiety, as we said, oftentimes um, <laughs> leads to depression. Um You know, you can also just think about your own kind of powers of persuasion when you're thinking about um, your husband. You know, what are other things that you have 
wanted him to do in the past, you know, mow the lawn or, you know, move mm-hmm. some boxes that he didn't really want to do, what's worked for him. Um, you probably know what's best in terms of how to influence him. But again, thinking about um, and being very clear with him that depression is a, a clinical disorder. It's not a, a flaw or a, not a flaw in his character is, is certainly important. All right. Thank you for sharing that with us, Kim. Let's go to John in Oakland. You're on About Health. Yeah, hi. It's it's an excellent program. I'd like to have you uh, address the issue of incarcerated fathers and and their children, Um, Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe just a dynamic of of a family that's dealing with that. Uh, Thank you. Mm. Well, John, you know, I'm actually not in a a position to really speak to that. Um, I think that separation, though, um, is certainly... um, you know, it's certainly agonizing for fathers and for their kids. Um, and don't know that I can say much else about that. All right. Thank, thanks for answering that question, John. What is the essence of treatment? I mean, when you, obviously there are different ways to approach the treatment of postpartum depression in men. But what, as a professional, what what are the uh, kind of the, the basics of the restoration of self-esteem and the reversal of depression? Well, you're right. There's a whole range from from very traditional to more alternative you know, approaches to to dealing with depression. Um, but certainly, talk therapy and medication are proven to be effective in treating depression. Um, and it's you know it's so important that men understand this. That um, you know the biggest problem for men is not in fact the depression itself, but the fact that they too often wait to get help and that's the worst thing that they can do. The sooner they get help, the better. Um, so talk therapy and, and medication are probably the best um, um, treatments available for treating depression. And most people think that once you go into the mental health system that you never come out. I mean obviously with depression that's not true. I mean, I mean, but, but I, I can get you five men in a room and say, well, once I go in and get a therapist, I'll never get out of there because, you know, it's a, it, it, you can't solve these problems. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's, it's so interesting because, um, you know, I, I think men probably are recognizing something about themselves uh, when they say something like that because, you know, I've done focus groups with men, I've done groups and see men in therapy, and usually once you get men talking, You can't really shut them up. They have so much to say that they've bottled up for, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years um, that they, they, they can't stop talking. You know, I've noticed this in focus groups with men talking about men's health. Um, men really do have concerns about their health, their emotional health, um, and their physical health. And once you allow them, once they have a good ear, um, they have a lot to say about it. Well, give us uh, uh, your your um, website again so that people know where to go when they do. That's saddaddy.com, S-A-D-D-A-D-D-Y, saddaddy.com. And, again, there's lots of information there, uh, resources for men um, who are concerned that they might have postpartum depression. There's a self-assessment that men can complete uh, to to determine whether they might be depressed. Uh, There's also an online form uh, for men to participate in so that they can talk with other dads who are experiencing postpartum depression and they can remain anonymous, which I think is a is a real plus for men. If, if you had, you know, here again, we go, I like the perfect world, obviously. <clears throat> the older I get, the more I like it. Uh, what would you say to people who are listening who are putting together a, a post, a prepartum curriculums and, and how they can incorporate that into their, these, these kinds, uh, this discussion of the potential for fathers to be, um, have postpartum depression as well as moms. How would you suggest that? Is there one form that obstetricians could use or you know, other people could use that you would recommend to assess? I uh, know in pediatrics they give us all these mm-hmm, tests. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is there one that you believe will work? Um, well, the Edinburgh is an, a self-assessment for postpartum depression, and that is what is on Edinburgh. Uh, yes, okay. and that is on my website now. But the the scoring is different from what. The, so if you were to give that to a woman in your in your practice, um, that would be different the scoring for it than it is for men. But that's that's probably the best assessment in terms of um, educators kind of. Um, 
who are working with expectant parents, I think just talking about the fact that both men and women can experience postpartum depression, helping them identify some of the signs of postpartum depression, and also letting them know what some of the possible causes are so that they can anticipate that, so they can get couples counseling ahead of time if they have a poor relationship where dads can um, go into an expectant father's group mm-hmm. if they are anxious about becoming a father. Those are some of the things that they can do to prepare for it. And saddaddy.com. Saddaddy.com. All right, Dr. Will Courtney, thank you very much for taking the time. Thanks to Mickey for helping me again uh, to su- select great guests and to um, run our program. Thanks to the Ethnic Health Institute for the time that they give us. And most of all, thank you for joining us on today's edition of About Health. Postpartum depression in men. Remember, health is your biggest asset. I'm Dr. Michael Noah. We'll talk again. The question not only is what would Barack Obama do if I were his pastor, what would he do if Dr. King was his pastor? There's no question that he would have to distance himself from Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was considered dangerous because he was willing to speak as the Quaker brothers and sisters say truth to power. This is an excerpt from a speech by Michael Eric Dyson from April of this year. This and other gifts from our recent marathon are available to you online at kpfa.org. In addition to donating your support to KPFA online, you can also find out information about your favorite shows, discover new ones, and even subscribe to the KPFA newsletter. Your online support helps KPFA be there for you in the future. Check out the various gifts available to you for a donation. KPFA is here because of the support from listeners like you. Visit